Spider-Man has a great set of villains, so today we're gonna stop and rank all 16 cinematic Spider-Man villains from the worst to the best. If you're new here, my name is Sean Chandler, and I started this channel essentially because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies and superheroes way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place and consider clicking that subscribe button. Also with that in mind, I'd love to talk about the Spider-Man villains with you. So go ahead and join us down in the comment section. Give us your rankings. Tell us which ones you love, which ones you hate, everything in between. We're going to disagree. There's no reason to get worked up or angry if I have someone too low on my list or something like that. Let's have a nice, lively, yeah, respectful conversation. And a couple more things before I get started. First off, this video does contain spoilers for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. There's a couple villains that are in the movie that have kind of twists and turns that are not revealed in the trailers, and I talk about those plot points in this video. Second thing, I'm ranking them based off of intrigue, character development, that sort of stuff. I'm not ranking them based off of power. With that said, let's get started. Coming in in last place is the Rhino. They take a classic Spider-Man villain and they give him a horrible horrible treatment. He's used just to bookend the movie, and the idea here is pretty terrible, and the execution is even worse. There's no character arc, there's no plan scheme or anything like that. He's just this insane, screaming, coked out Russian that's arrested at the beginning of the movie and then just comes back at the very end in a robot suit. There's no logic sense to any of it. They don't do justice to the character, and they make the character seem horrible, so he comes in in last place. Coming in at number 15 is Venom from Spider-Man 3. They take this iconic Spider-Man villain with this excellent origin story that ties back to Peter Parker and they water the whole thing down and essentially just turn Venom into a boss fight at the end of the movie. He shows up and as often as possible they make his face go away so you see Topher Grace in the CGI and we don't really get any of the fun, any of the conflict, any of the stuff that makes Venom this great foe. It's all absent from this film. He's only there there to be a guy throwing punches at the end of the film, and so this is a total waste of a great character. And number 14 is Electro. This is a very odd interpretation of the character that doesn't fit in the movie around him. Before he becomes Electro at the beginning of the film, he's so cartoonish and over the top in his awkwardness and nerdiness that he feels like he's out of like a 1950s movie, and it doesn't mesh at all with the naturalistic portrayals of Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone in the film. And then his actual villain arc in the film is a very overused trope that was used in Batman uh, Forever, it was used in The Incredibles, it was used in Iron Man 3, and it's used once again here, this plot line about someone that looks up to the hero, but then when they're betrayed becomes a super villain or feel betrayed, and it just doesn't play out right, it doesn't fit in the rest of the movie, and it doesn't do justice to the character. Number 13 is Scorpion. Now really, this is just a tease of the character in a post credit scene, an indicator of where things things might be going. There's not really character arc or development here. It doesn't damage the character's reputation like the bottom three on this video, but there's not a whole lot here to really enjoy, so he comes in pretty low on the list. At number 12 is the Tinkerer. Now, it's nice to see him in the movie, but this is, once again, a little bit more of an Easter egg of a character. There's a lot of deviations from the comic book source character. This is something that they put in there for the comic book fans, so they put a big grin on their face, but we're not really getting a proper version of the Tinkerer as a Spider-Man villain. Coming in at number 11 is the Shocker. We actually get a couple of different versions of the Shocker in this film, but he's treated much more as a henchman. There's not a character arc. There's not really motivations. It's just one of Vulture's henchmen that's trying to take out Spider-Man at different points in time in the movie. So it is nice to see some version of the Shocker in here, but if you're a big fan of the Shocker, you probably didn't watch this movie and go, finally the version of the Shocker that I've always wanted to see in the movies. Nice to see him but not the definitive version. Bringing us into the top 10 is Sandman. Now, I thought Thomas Hayden Church did a nice job of making for a both menacing as well as somewhat sympathetic version of the character. He can emote really well and make faces that make you feel sorry for him, but it always, I never liked that they retconned the Uncle Ben storyline to kind of squeeze him into the mix. It felt like they were going back to try and rehash successful plot beats that worked in previous films 
and that just didn't work for me here. And unfortunately, they pushed Sandman into that mix, and so it weakened his effect for me as a character. If they had just let him be the Sandman in a film with kind of his different types of powers and motivations, I think it would have been much stronger as a character. And number nine is Dr. Octopus from Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Now, I actually really enjoyed this character inside of this film. The way they're used, they're set up nicely in the first little bit of the film, and there's a nice twist as the character comes back into the mix as this mad scientist and has some nice fun moments playing off of Peter B. Parker. I love that little scene with the between the two of them. But the character doesn't have much of a character arc here. We're not really given any motivations. And so while I really enjoy this character, it's not one of the great characters on this list because at the end of the day, the characters used mostly is just a henchman for the Kingpin's plan. Coming in at number eight is Green Goblin from The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Now this is one of the most mixed characters for me on this list. I loved the way they set up Harry and Peter's relationship at the beginning of the film. I think that's some of Mark Webb's best stuff when he's dealing with character relationships. And so they establish the hurt and pain and loneliness of Harry at the beginning of the film. But then as it progresses more to him becoming Green Goblin, it seemed really rushed as his anger towards Spider-Man grew. And then as they make him the Green Goblin, it just was too literal for me, the direction that they went with things that I just, I don't think that that was for the best inside of the film, the way they visualized the actual goblinness of Harry in the film. And so I really enjoyed aspects of it, that there's an actual threat that's personal, painful in what he does in the third act of the film. I just wish they could have fleshed it out a little bit better in the way it transitioned into becoming evil. Number seven is the lizard. For me, this is the most mediocre villain on the list. And I don't even say that as an insult. I think that he's good enough. I don't have any big issues with the character. It's, he's established with a relationship with Peter Parker, why he's doing what he's doing. And then he tests stuff on himself and it drives him a little bit crazy. And then he turns into a supervillain. But, and we've seen this before in other Spider-Man movies. And that's kind of the problem here is that it's a very tried and true Spider-Man type villain. The scientist that tests things on himself and he becomes his own worst enemy. And so that's probably why he's a little bit lower. If we didn't have some of the other characters that are higher up on this list, he might be a little bit more interesting to me. But as is, he's like, oh, that's a good enough version of this type of Spider-Man villain. But we've seen it before and better. Coming in at number six is the new Goblin. Now, this is the character that I think had the most potential to be great, but didn't quite live up to that potential because of the movie he was in. They thoroughly established Harry's anger and rage towards Spider-Man in the previous two films. So we understood his motivation, where he's coming from. And then in the film, they touch on it. They give us elements of the greatness of what it could have been. But because they had other villains in the mix and too many storylines going on, we didn't get to flesh it out quite well enough. We really only get the one sequence of him as the villain new goblin in the film. And it's not a great sequence overall, especially because of the CGI and the way things play out. But at the same time, I really like this arc for Harry that they had where he gets to be both the villain filled with rage as well as redemption by the end of the film. And it's all a, a reasonable extension of the character that they established in the previous films. So overall, this is one of the most frustrating the characters for me because he could have been so great if they would have focused in on his character alone. Real quick, before I give you my top five, remember to give me your ranking down below in the comment section. We're going to disagree that's a good thing. That's a fun thing. So don't be a jerk in the comment section if someone disagrees with you, especially this guy right here. Let's just have a nice, lively discussion about ideas. Also, after this video, be sure to check out this playlist up above with some of my best Spider-Man videos. If you like this video, there's something else in there that you'll enjoy. Bringing us into the top five is The Prowler. Now, if you haven't seen Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, I'm about to spoil a big twist inside of the film. So go ahead and skip ahead about a minute. So with that said, this character is handled so nicely because he's established in the first half of the film in two different plot lines as we have him as the uncle that's kind of the cool guy that's trying to help out Miles while his dad 
kind of treats him like he's this screw up loser and we kind of think he's this screw up loser. And then he's also established as the Prowler himself, this terrifying villain that hunts down people as one of Kingpin's henchmen. And then as the film progresses and we have this big reveal in the second half of the film, it gives so much more weight to this character as we realize he's not some loser that's just a screw up. He's a really dark and evil guy. And they give him this great little moment at the end as he realizes what he's doing and the cost of it as he's holding his nephew in his hand. And so this character is handled so nicely, especially for a PG movie. Such a great little character inside of the film. He's not one of the top villains because they didn't give him enough screen time quite for that, but still a great second villain in a film. Coming in at number four is Kingpin. I was pretty shocked at where they were able able to go in a PG animated film with this character and multiple points in time in this film, they show him brutally, physically killing characters that you would not expect him to be killing inside of a film for the whole family. But beyond that, they don't just make him this menacing threat, they really establish him as this nuanced character that has people he cares about. He has things that he values. He's just also a very selfish person that wants power, money, and it just drives him to very dark and evil places. And the whole plot of this movie is driven by his value sets as well as that evil selfish character quality about him all in all it makes for a very well-rounded nuanced character that's absolutely fascinating to see on screen kicking off the top three is dr octopus from spider-man 2 alfred molina brings this classic spider-man villain to the big screen and makes him now a classic spider-man movie villain early on we see him as this very happy jovial scientist that's trying to do things that are good for the the world and then his technology drives him crazy as an accident occurs and it makes him into this monster that he never wanted to be. As the movie progresses we get to see him become more and more evil and locked in on the control of his tentacles have over his body and by the time we get to the end of the film he gets this little moment of redemption that just makes for such a powerful demise for a character. The pieces all come together to make for a very powerful emotional finale in a great story arc for the character. Our runner-up is Green Goblin from the original Spider-Man. Willem Dafoe brings such an energetic, over-the-top performance to this film that in most movies would feel out of place, wouldn't work, it would be too much, but because of the world that Raimi has crafted that has this comic booky vibe to it with the music score that's present, it absolutely works inside of this film. You're able to see him as this man driven mad by his own technologies and experiments. There's been several scenes inside of it where he's talking to himself and he just does such a great job of selling a situation that's crazy. All along the way, the character is woven throughout the storyline. So we see him as the father of Peter's best friend. We see him as having a relationship with Peter himself. And we see him as someone that has his own motivations in the world with his technology company. So as he's driven mad and stopped at times by Spider-Man, we see where he's coming from. All of this leading to a finale where by his own hand, he faces his demise. And in it, he has this moment where he realized he's embarrassed at what he's done and doesn't want his son to see what happens. And part of what makes it so great is his death is then sets up Harry's arc for the next two films. And so it's so nicely woven into the storyline to just make for some great storytelling, a villain that we get to spend a lot of time with, get to understand the person as well as the villain, the character inside of the mask. So he's one of my absolute favorites. But coming in at number one is going to be the Vulture. What they were able to do with this character is have a very different type of villain. He's not a scientist that's been driven mad by his own technology. He's not a super villain trying to blow up the city. He's a guy that feels wrong by the world and has decided to turn to crime to take care of his family. You understand where he's coming from and you can see the small steps that would lead him to being the person that he is in this film. And even his super big evil scheme in the film is just selling weapons. Part of what makes it absolutely work here is that you got someone like Michael Keaton in the role who can be charming, charismatic when you see him hanging out with Peter Parker at his house and in a car ride, and then he can be 
terrifying with just a snap. So for me, because he's a little bit more grounded, it's more personal, he comes in at number one. Remember to check out that playlist over there with my best Spider-Man videos. If you enjoy this ranking, there's absolutely something else in there that you will enjoy. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.